good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, depending uh, from where you are getting connected now. Good afternoon, Ron. How are you today? I'm good. How are you, Remy? I'm good. I'm good. Amazing. Happy to see you again. The last webinars two months ago. The last webinar two months ago, I was not available, but uh, uh, I heard so many good things about it, and I watched the replay. It was really interesting. So it's time now. It's 7 p.m. here in France. Welcome to all of you from wherever you are around the world for this webinar again on uh, laser therapy with uh, Dr. Riegel. Um, so this is how it's going to work for those that don't really know uh, and that are attending for the first time. I'm going to introduce quickly to you the company. I'm going to introduce you to Ron. Then he's going to do the presentation on how does the laser therapy accelerate wound healing uh, for about maybe 40 minutes, something like that, 40, 45 minutes. Dr. Regan knows that I always try to have it uh, around 40 minutes, but there's so many important information. Uh, but right after, stay connected because we're going to have some question and answers live. So you will be able to leave your questions in the chat box during the presentation. So feel free to uh, leave your question. Okay, so before starting with you, Ron, I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'm going to introduce you quickly uh, the company and uh, so everyone can understand how it works uh, for uh, the webinar, for today's webinar. So can you confirm uh, that you're seeing my screen, Ron? I am seeing your screen, yes. Okay. Perfect. So Manu Medical is a company that has been created more than 20 years ago. We always have been specialists since the beginning in veterinary equipment only. So this is our specialty. We are more than 20 people now in the company. And uh, last year we have been purchased by the company called Genia, that is a French company also. And they are internationally renowned manufacturer of premium veterinary supplies. Uh, with a, always a focus on innovation for improving the well-being of animals during every stage of the surgical and recovery process. process. So as you can see below, this is all the range of product that uh, Genia, Genia is doing uh, worldwide. Why do I say worldwide? Uh, because we have branches, uh, the company is based in France, but we have fr uh, branches also in the US. We have one in Hong Kong. We also have Australia. We just opened a subsidiary also now in Germany. And the goal of the company is always to provide uh, veterinarians with quality products uh, to make a better practice and uh, trying also to improve the comfort and hygiene of the animal. OK, so this is what I just told you about our branches. We are more than 120 people now all around the world. And thanks to the partnership, I mean, with, with the purchase of uh, Mano Medical by Genia, Mano Medical can expand and uh, offer and provide all of our equipment all around the world, thanks to also those subsidiaries. Okay, so we had a few webinars already. Yeah? This is probably the number seven, I think. So you will find all, all of our replay on our YouTube channel. Okay, we talk about uh, laser therapy in equine practice last year, for example. The very, 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 very interesting one. If you are deciding and still thinking about buying a laser for the first time, we had a, a great webinar when you need to think about the most important considerations when you want to purchase a laser. So this is available on our YouTube channel. Today, we're going to speak about uh, the acceleration of one's healing thanks to the laser. And there's going to be a last one for this year in September. So please, you can note that we are going to have a webinar on the benefits of laser therapy in canine rehabilitation in September. OK, Dr. Ron Wiegel uh, is the co-founder of the American Institute of Medical Laser Applications. In 2009, he provides education on all types of medical lasers in both veterinary medicine and other healthcare professions also. He has authored more than two, a dozen papers and books, uh, especially one that uh, we were providing to our vets in France. That is uh, what I would call almost a Bible, <laughs> laser therapy in veterinary medicine photobiomodulation. 
okay so you can have all your questions at the end after ron's presentation you can note also my email but in every countries from wherever you are you will have a distributor that will be able to take care of you so you can contact me or either contact your distributor if you have any question regarding the company regarding the laser regarding the education or anything else all right so now i'm going to Stop sharing my screen and I'm going to give Ron the possibility of doing it. So it's here. Tell me now if it's okay for you. Should be. Yes, Should be perfect. So now I'm going to back off, yeah. turn off my camera and your microphone, and that's uh, all yours, Ron. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. So you can see my entire screen, correct? Because I've got some stuff over here that uh, I'm just kind of blocking the way here. You can yes, see my can, old screen. I mean, your, okay. your screen, and we can see your face too at the same time. It's small. Okay. More entertaining. Well, we ought to minimize that as much as possible. Anyway, thank you for the, the kind introduction there. And welcome colleagues, veterinary technicians, veterinary nurses, practice manager, and all those interested in laser therapy to this lecture on how does laser therapy accelerate wound healing. This webinar is for those that may have just purchased a therapy laser or considering purchasing a therapy laser or already have a therapy laser and want to understand how it works to healing wounds and maybe be able to, with that knowledge, be able to integrate it more into their wound care protocols that they're currently using. So I have a few things to disclose. Uh, Number one is, is that, like you said, I am the co-founder of the American Institute of Medical Laser Application. And what we do is we basically provide training. Because back in 2007, 2008, I mean, there was several lasers on the market, but nobody was offering training. And I thought that was a travesty. And the opportunity came up for me to be able to try to headline that. And so we have a website on that you can go and take online courses for some of the fundamental information. Again, I am the co-editor of the textbook Laser Therapy and Veterinary Medicine, uh, Photobiomodulation. Photobiomodulation is, you know, basically another term meaning laser therapy. And I'm also author of seven chapters in that book. And there's a chapter on companion animal and equine in this textbook. And I wrote the equine one on specifically wound healing. So if you want further information on that and do get the book or you have questions about some of the things I've brought up here, you can go and consult that as a further reference here. And again, I have published numerous papers and I've been fortunate enough and blessed enough to be able to teach and, and present all around the world. I'm also a fellow in the American Society of Laser Medicine and Surgery and membership in the Optic Society, a photobiomation board member. And I don't have a period and was really unique. I'm, a, I'm the only American member of the Japanese Veterinary Medical Laser Associate, uh, Society. And I'm a member of several veterinary medical, uh, several veterinary medical and veterinary advisory boards of which none of have any effect on the information I'm about to share here. So you're gonna get a, you know, Thank you, Mano Medical, for sponsoring this, but you're going to get broad strokes here. This is going to be, you know, very relevant information for not just Mano Medical's laser, which is a, you know, extremely good product here, but everything, everybody's laser. So with that, my personal history is I've been to practice for 25 years and I bought my first therapy laser in 1979. And that's a picture of it right there. It was from China and it was a one milliwatt. So I've gone from one milliwatt to even at some times using 60 watt lasers now for therapy, which is uh, extremely powerful, more powerful than what you'd ever need. And again, I've had the benefit of you know learning by trial and error. What I'm gonna tell you here took me years to compile and uh, understand so in a matter of 40 minutes here i'm going to be able to hopefully share with you the knowledge that i've gained over all these years and again co-founded the england 2009 so what are we going to do today we're going to talk about what laser provides to your patients and the practice in general i'm going to go through the four phases of wound healing and how laser therapy accelerates wound healing within each one of these stages that's what it is so we still go through the four phases but what we're going to do is show how laser therapy's mechanism of action and how it can accelerate that wound healing process then we're going to go through dosing and application techniques and the frequency of administration with a lot of different wounds I'm gonna to briefly touch on the scientific evidence and you're gonna see why when I get to that portion of it because there's a preponderance of evidence in the literature about using laser therapy for wound healing. And then probably the most interesting part of all is gonna be the clinical applications and case example. I kind of took a cross uh, 
cut of all the cases that I have, because honestly, in this laptop, I'm sure I have over 500 cases of of different kinds of wounds and how they were treated. So I picked a, a you know a, some from each category, including you know canine and uh, equine. So we'll have all that today. So what are actually the clinical outcomes of laser therapy? What happens when you laser your patients? Number one, we get a relief of pain. There's an analgesic effect, and I'm not going to go in. I did that on the last webinar, and you can, if you want to explore that further, you can listen to that webinar, and I go into basically the mechanism of action for that. And it, modulation of the inflammatory response, and this is a big portion of how it accelerates wound healing. It, you know, We still have all the stages of inflammation, but they are shorter. And of course, you increase microcirculation, and therefore, it's an acceleration of the healing process. So that's what it does for every case. And then, you know, there's this is a very versatile modality that can be used in a number of different cases in your in your practice. And I actually covered some of those in previous webinars here. So let's first define wound healing. Wound healing is the natural systemic restorative response to any traumatic insult to the skin or other body tissues, such as a muscle, a tendon, even bone. So when that traumatic incident occurs, an orchestrated biochemical cascade event is set into motion and aimed at repairing that area. So it's a natural process and we divide this process and you know this is how it was taught to me in veterinary school is divided into four overlapping phases. We have a hemostasis phase and that's very important for what I'm gonna tell you about that phase an inflammatory phase, which I briefly touched on at the beginning here, a proliferation or tissue growth phase, and then a maturation phase. And that's, you know, finally ending up with a totally healed wound. So laser therapy has been shown to have significant stimulating influences on the healing of wounds. And this has been all through the literature, as you can see back to 1971. It is uh, Mesters when uh, a long time ago. Uh, he was one of the first ones to, he was like the, one of the fathers of laser therapy. Understanding the mechanism by which laser therapy influence, influences each one of these phases allows individualized modifications to the treatment of each patient so that you have a better outcome for each patient. And, you know, the result is we, we want is consistent results, consistent individualized acceleration of the healing process in each one of our patients. So that's why we want to explain how it works so that you can take that information and extrapolate it to each individual case that walks in the door. So let's go through the physiological actions, a mechanism of action here on wound healing. Photobiomodulation therapy, laser therapy is then basically administered to the patient. And these are not in any order, but they are just basically some of the many things of the biochemical cascade of events that happen. And you get an increased leukocyte activity, increased macrophage activity, increased vascular regeneration, increased fibroblast proliferation, early cell regeneration, enhanced cell differentiation, and improved you know, the tensile strength basically through the collagen. And then bottom line is you get an accelerated wound healing effect. If that's many documentations in the literature, therefore having a reduced healing time. And that's what we want. We want our patients to heal the fastest way possible. We want them to heal well and we want them to heal pain-free as much as possible. But these again, I'm going to elaborate on these. These are just general topics here, but that's kind of the biochemical cascade of event that, that basically results in a reduced healing time. So let's talk about this important first phase, the hemostasis phase. I mean, it, you know, there's an immediate vasoconstriction when we have an injury, a wound. And we, what that vasoconstriction does is it limits our blood loss, supposedly, unless it's a very, very large wound, results in a temporary blanching of the wound because there's vasoconstriction around the wound, not just the wound itself. Platelet aggregation, why? Because we want to form a clot. And then hemostasis, basically, because of that clot, that platelet plug formation, you're, you're getting a cessation of the bleeding, which is hemostasis. Now, these are all cytokines, chemokines, hormones are all released and the activation of fibrins, which forms a mesh, acts as a glue to bind platelets together. These are all things we learned back in school. And this clot plug, so break in the blood vessels and then slowing or preventing further hemorrhage, okay? This is the important take home message here. Laser therapy, photobiomodulation therapy should not, not be applied until a state of hemostasis is reached. If it is applied during active hemorrhage, the resulting vasodilation that laser therapy you know, causes will accelerate the hemorrhaging and prevent further clot formation. And believe me, that uh, 
was very evident back in the day. I mean, what you want to do is you want to ice it first and then laser. So if you basically, where I first found it out, there was a basically a small injury, not a small, but a, a significant injury to a, a horse, an equine horse. And I applied laser because, you know, it looks swollen. It had it have only been a couple of hours all, old so i figured you know that the laser would it would benefit from laser therapy and this was back in the 80s and before my very eyes while i was lasering that subject the patient's anatomical area swelled up so i knew right away that i needed to stop and ice it some more because all the micro hemorrhages were there were hemorrhaging more the swelling there was a you know by me causing vasodilation there was more fluid escaping in the area was even becoming more swollen and so that was an important lesson there then that was outlined in the literature at a later day so do not apply it during that phase now the inflammatory phase once the hemostasis is achieved this is probably you know the first area where laser therapy really really shortens this phase and helps so foreign substances dead tissue are removed during this phase while vascular responses prepare the environment to sustain then sustain the next two phases of of healing and vasodilation is follows the initial vasoconstriction. And again, this we all know the mechanism how that vasodilation occurs with histamine, prostaglandins, kinins, and leukotrienes. Phase vasodilation results in an increased blood flow accompanied by the necessary inflammatory cells and factors to fight infection and basically debride the wound of devitalized tissue. Transdermal application of laser therapy modifies this vascular endothelial function by increasing its antioxidant and angiogenic potential. And again, this is a complex sequence of biochemical and physiological events. And if these events go astray, the result is a chronic wound, excessive fibrosis or suppuration in the wound here. So we want to stop that. So again, how does laser therapy do this? Honestly, the biggest biggest cause of this is the increased production and release of nitric oxide. This is a potent vasodilator. And this increases the porousness of the blood vessels, which facilitates the entry of leukocytes and macrophages into the wound site. And again, mediators such as cytokines, chemokines regulate the immune, immune immunological response of inflammation using different signaling mechanisms. And again, so we're not only releasing nitric oxide here, we're also releasing cytokines into the tissue, which helps with the immune response of the patient. And again, uh, when certain wavelengths of light are shined, are, are basically, the, uh, certain tissues are exposed to certain wavelengths of light, there's an increased production of these cytokines. So your immune, immune, immune response is even more so. So again, the other thing that it does in this phase is it modulates the process by regulating the inflammatory cytokine uh, interleukin. Uh, one uh, beta. That's uh, one of the big ones. There's some other ones that go there, but that's the most frequently. Then we've got the proliferative phase here, which uh, begins approximately, you know, formation of fleshy granulation tissue occurs approximately three to five days following the injury and marks the beginning of the this phase of healing. And again, these phases all overlap. So there's really no clear cut where one starts and one finishes. And again, we know this includes inflammatory cells, fibroblasts, neovascular, and a matrix of fibrogen, fibronectin, collagen, glucosaminoglycans, and proteoglycans. Again, all my references are here, but this proliferative phase can also be subdivided into angiogenesis genesis, you know, an increase in the vasculature, fibroplasia, collagen deposition, and granulation tissue formation. What we want is re-epithelialization. We want the, the, you know, dermis to basically close that wound and then the wound to contract. So that's our goals. And again, these are all in the literature from 1996. And what happens is laser therapy promotes angiogenesis on a broad spectrum of research models. Hamblin was one of the first ones in 2008 to outline the beneficial effects of nitric oxide, which include pain relief and resolution of edema, improved lymphatic drainment, and improved wound healing via angiogenesis. That was the purpose of his first, one of his first papers there. And he um, is a uh, out of the Harvard University at that time. Angiogenesis and improved wound healing and disturbed route and flap, that was 2014. And again, I just picked some literature out here just to show you that it is scientific evidence-based that I'm quoting here. And therapeutic dose range for using blood flow to the biceps brachii and medicine in the fore, 
for Lim, Larkin has published a number of papers over the years and, and all very good. So let's talk about fibroplasia here with the first, you know, three to five days after the injury. Fibroblasts and metastasized cells migrate, proliferate, and differentiate in response to fibronectin, fibroblast growth factor, and transforming growth factors. And again, laser therapy has a proliferative effect on fibroblasts, keratinocytes, endothelial cells, lymphocytes, muscle cells, and stem cells. And again, there's a lot of literature references for that. These cells release reactive oxygen species. So you know, basically, that's the second thing that is most commonly the, the result of, of laser therapy or cellular irradiation is the release of radioactive oxygen species, which basically results in the expression of transcription factors, which then activate a form of nitric oxide synthase and cause that proliferation. It improves the remodel, remodeling of the extracellular matrix during the healing process and tendons or activation of matrix metapeptides two and stimulation of the collagen synthesis. So I'm gonna go into the collagen uh, model here in a second here. And again, uh, the re-epithelialization of the epidermis occurs alongside or you know, concurrently with fibroplasia. And this again involves the migration of cells at the wound endings over a distance of greater than one millimeter from one side to the other. I actually have a case in my case files here that I'm gonna reiterate that, and drive that point home a little bit. And again, it aids in the proliferation of cells, evil cells in a single case study, a patient suffering from thalesmia intermedia with a non-healing ulcer in the ankle was aerated a dose of 17.3 joules per square centimeter daily for two weeks, followed by an average of 6.5 joules per square centimeter for another two weeks. And there was complete re-epithelialization of this ulcer and no reoccurrence at all in and follow up up to six months later. So he was followed up not just in six months, but several times during that period. So again, you can see that that dose caused that complete resolution of that ulcer. Wound contraction begins concurrently with the senses of the collagen. So here we go with the collagen. Contraction results in the proliferation activation of different fibroblasts, myofibroblasts, and the granulation tissue, which contains filaments of smooth muscle actin. And basically, laser therapy increases the transformation and proliferation of fibroblasts into myofibroblasts, accelerating wound contraction. So that's its mechanism of action right there. It causes the fibroblast to Basically, there's releasing of biochemical contents that speed this, this uh, transformation up. Maturation phase, when the ledge of collar production and degradation equalize, the maturation of fish phase of tissue repair has begun. During that, we basically are remodeling the collagen. So type three, which is prevalent during proliferation, is replaced by type one collagen. Disorganized collagen fibers are rearranged, cross-linked, aligned along tension lines. We know that. And what happens with laser therapy, it stimulates a better alignment and normal distribution of type one and three collagen during this phase of healing. Again, it increases fibroblast multiplication, differentiation, mortality, Motility and collagen production, all of which result in earlier wound closure. And again, higher percentage generated with, after laser therapy is a higher percentage of type three collagen, which builds up stronger but less exuberant scars, and is most important for the cosmetic of resolution of wounds in the equine. I mean, we don't, you know, want any kind of scar tissue visible on our horses or any of our patients, really. I mean, especially the same thing applies to the, the, the canines that are used for shows. So enough of that biochemical cascade of events. Let's get down to the, the things that will help you apply this clinically. We now know that there's plenty of evidence of the mechanism of action. Now let's talk about dosing. So dosages are determined by, of course, the anatomical area that our wound is in. Whether the wound is open or closed, whether we've sutured it closed or whether it's going to be left to heal openly, whether it's acute or chronic, what tissues are involved in the presence or absence of infection or contamination. Now you can just kind of just run those through your mind and you can understand why the dosages would be different. This is a table out of uh, the textbook. And again, this is in general. And as you can see what happens when you have something acute and very superficial and inflamed, it's a very light dose because why? Your target tissue is visible to your eye. You can see it. So if you can see it, you know, it's not very deep. It's, you know, more of an abrasion even that would be included in here. And it doesn't take a whole lot of dosage. If it's, if the deeper it goes, the more dosage you want to use. Now, why is chronic superficial so much more than acute superficial is because those cells have basically need to be the 
mechanism of action, the biochemical cascade events has to be initiated in those chronic cells. Those unhappy cells, as I call them, have to be stimulated to become happy cells or reproduce happy cells. So right there, it takes more energy to do that. We want more saturation of that target tissue there. Acute superficial with pain and injury, we give them a little bit higher dose because it, you know, again, we want to make sure that we can get some analgesic effect immediately after the therapy. And acute deep, of course, as you see there, the dose goes up again. And then chronic deep pain or injury, uh, again, six to 20 joules per square centimeter is, is common. Equine, I'm the one that you know, basically drew up this table. Of course, it's a lot more involved because that's where my expertise is for nothing else. And again, abrasions on an equine, they're very superficial. So the target is right there. And I'm not gonna go through all these, but an incision, you think, well, you know, that's very superficial too, but you gotta remember that incision is all the way to whatever we did surgery uh, wise, you know, did we do an orthopedic procedure? Did we do an abdominal procedure? Something like that. So again, that's why the higher dosage than just a simple abrasion or a laceration that's sutured. A laceration that's sutured versus an incision that's sutured is different because there's a lot of damage to the tissue around it. And we wanna make sure that there's enough saturation of photonic energy to those structures that we get the clinical response that we talked about earlier here. An open laceration, of course, that's going to be more. And we're gonna talk about those in the equine section of the cases here. And again, as you go down here, punctures, those are the ones that you basically on the equine, you want them to heal from the inside out. You don't want them to seal over or have an epithelialization along the top and still have infection in the bottom. So again, you might those doses might not be as high as you think they should be. And chronic, the same uh, basically fundamental information about you have to take the unhappy cells and make them happy. And so it takes more energy to do that. Now, those look very complicated. And if you have a laser, the laser, the mental medical laser has done the work for you because in the software, you basically pick a species and then you can pick there's some other parameters that you have to choose. But what this software does is when you finally make all your choices, it comes up with a protocol that basically you can start with. So if it says, you know, you should start with six joules per square centimeter, it will calculate, you will give the area in there and everything else, and it'll tell you basically what you should do. And then with your clinical experience, you can go, well, maybe that's not enough. So you add to it, or maybe that's, I think you know I can start a little smaller, so you reduce that amount. So all the software does is it basically very quickly and very easily provides you a place to start, but it also provides you a way to make your own protocol out of it for each patient, because every one of our patients is different. I mean, there's no two dogs that walk in the clinic that are almost the same. There's no two horses that I saw that were almost the same. Now, application technique, now we have enough energy delivered to the area. Now we have to apply it in the right technique so that it basically is absorbed and be able to penetrate down into the target tissue. Almost all wounds initially, and I mean like 99.5, 99.9% have to be treated off contact. Why? Because it's painful or you have the chance of contamination or something like that. So we have to treat them off contact. So we don't, we have to increase the dose a little bit at the beginning when it's off contact because we're losing so some of our energy that's being down there. And then you wanna keep your handpiece perpendicular to your target tissue. This is actually an illustration here that was given to me by a professor in Japan. And basically this is a mixture of milk and uh, let's see, uh, oh my gosh. Anyway, it's a liquid and it's got protein, you know, fat and carbohydrate in it. The only thing that it doesn't have, gelatin, that's the other thing it was mixed with. The only thing it does not have is blood. So, which is an you know incidental absorber of the energy. So we have a nice we have a nice uh, nice area and shows you how that energy penetrates down through the tissue. So just imagine that every time that you're treating something, and if I put that handpiece at an angle, what happens? Same thing that happens when you put a flashlight or in parts of the world they call the torch, and you angle it towards the wall. What happens to your beam? You don't have the power density under it. So you want to keep it perpendicular, and then you want to administer it in to saturate every possible cell you can. So my wound over here on the right is a basically a regular red shape, and then I've got arrows here, you know, showing that I'm going to basically go back and forth across the room if I'm scanning or if I'm using something that's a point-to-point -point delivering system. I want to make sure that I cover every you know every square centimeter of that wound. 
Now, we also want to make sure that we include a good margin of the surrounding healthy tissue because right along the margins is where the epithelialization really occurs. So usually what happens with those is we want to identify those areas and make sure they receive sufficient energy. And a lot of times you'll be able to treat those on contact. You may have to go across the wound off contact, but on contact application when you're right around the wound. And different hand pieces, uh, you know, allow you to do that. And you can even, the one that you use on contact, you just simply lift it off contact and use it off contact. You don't have to switch hand pieces all the time on the, on the manomedical laser. And it provides a really good uh, delivery system for the energy. How often should we treat it? Now, as we know, that, that depends on how compliant the client is. <laughs> you know, so if it's an acute wound in the ideal world, open or closed, we want to treat it daily until a physical response is noticed. And then we want to change it. After that response, we want to space out the sessions until resolution is achieved. Okay. Now, treating it daily is often very, very difficult logistically because if you'd say client, that would mean they'd have to bring the dog into the clinic all the time or the patient, the feline into the clinic all the time. Whereas if it stays in the hospital, that's an easy thing to do. So again, common sense dictates the treatment, but bottom line is you want to be very aggressive. You want to treat it as often as possible. Chronic conditions, I've seen several of them that, you know, basically when they received two therapy sessions a day, seem to have better results. Do I have statistics to back that up? No, I just have many, many cases and lots of field experience to back that up. So if they are in the hospital and time does permit and you think it would benefit, you know, do it first thing in the morning and again in the evening, you know, space it out as many hours as you can. And then the same thing holds true. Once you find a clinical response to that, you want to space out the sessions so they correspond to the clinical process. Now, if the wound's debrided, it's a chronic wound and you bring it in there and you debride it, it immediately becomes an acute wound because you're taking tissue off there. So that falls back into the acute category. So I've got a number of interesting cases here. And again, I have so many to choose from. It was difficult for me to come up with what I thought would be interesting to share with everybody on this webinar here. So my first one here, this is a great big dog meets little dog. They don't get along. And big dog basically degloves a big portion of the skin. The skin was flapped all the way back here. Uh, on this patient, this patient was taken to an emergency clinic. And, and then Dr. Sears was basically the uh, uh, veterinarian that took care of the case after it was at the ER. And when she first sent me the picture like this, I said to her, I said, I said, what did they do? Try to set the record for the placement of Penrose drains. I've never seen so many drains in one patient, a patient that small. I've seen many drains, but not in a patient with this, this small body weight. So again, we have big stitches. Now we all know what the possibility and Dr. Sears did too, what's gonna happen here. You know, what are the chances of this after this big degloving injury, the interruption of the circulation of the dermis and everything, what are the chances of these stitches and these drains all working and this staying closed? Well, not very good. This is what it looked like on day seven. And as you can see, not only did the skin separate, some of it sloughed off, and basically we're left with a big granulation bed of tissue here and epidermis that's very swollen around the edges here. So this is what it looked like on day seven. Now, so doctor, doctor basically started standard wound care protocol with lavage, antibiotics, pain medications. And she was already immediately, as soon as she got it from the ER, started lasering it with three to five joules per square centimeter off contact with generous margins around the each. And even though with all the benefits of laser therapy, we still had this occur. Uh, so again, diligent work on her part. By day 38, this wound looked like this. Now notice, we have all those stages that I talked about, including wound contracture here. So this thing is progressing. In day 43, you know, that's only five days later. And you can see at this stage, it's really contracting way better. So day seven, and then I'm going to show you the end result here in a second here. But what doctor did here was, is she took it upon herself that she wanted to see you know, by applying the laser along the margins of the wound, she wanted to see how much epithelialization actually occurred. So again, she took about seven, well, she did, she took seven, exact seven places, and she measured every day, every single day that she saw this, and sometimes there was a couple of day intervals, but it was hospitalized for quite a while. But the normal in the literature, we expect a half to one millimeter a day, okay? And what she did when she utilized laser therapy on this, all those 
she averaged out all those places that she measured and she felt that she got 1.6 millimeters a day. In other words, she doubled it. She doubled the epithelial migration across her across the wound. That's huge. I mean, again, here's day 56 and you can see that this is almost was totally resolved. Yes, it's been two months, but still that's a big wound to heal. That's And again, look how good that's going to look. Yes, there, there's going to be a scar there and that dog's going to be able to tell all the other dogs how tough he was and through that fight and everything. And you should see the other guy, but still that's a very good result there. So let's talk about a surgical site dehiscence. Unfortunately, this is, I'm sure, happened to all of us. Here, this was Bella, five-year-old boxer, and had a mast cell tumor, grade one, with clean margins on histo, but a bit of necrosis within the pedicle and the dosage of five joules per square centimeter squared. Dr. Sarah here administered at six watts with a combination of on and off contact, but this is what happened. We had a dehiscence of the suture line. You can see in this area is very swollen. It looks very painful and everything else. So this was, again, five joules per square centimeter. She did this daily for the first five days, and you can see a lot of the swelling has gone out of the, of the wound here. But the other thing that you should notice is how much circulation has been reestablished. Look how nice and red. This was before the administration of therapy on laser therapy on that day. So again, this was from the day before. And you can see how nice and pink and red and vascularized that area is. And that's what helps with our with our healing. And that's four days later. I mean, look, we've gained a lot. Look how that flap that looked loose before and was was dangling there has now reattached itself. So here's another, you know, on the 16th, the and then again uh 20 days later here. So again, you can see that this is really coming down back in and now February, six days after that. And then almost you know basically let's see 71 days after the initial injury so after the initial surgery i'm sorry but it was a very large tumor that was taken off but that is a very nicely healed wound and honestly you know we all that have used it for quite a while all agree on one thing lasers love to heal wounds and this is i know these are all n1 cases but that believe me this is what you're con going to consistently see this is an interesting case. This is post-trauma injury, wound. This is a six-month-old female pit bull down in Dr. Sandra Sisk. And again, it was presented 24 hours after trauma to the left rear leg. So just think about that. Your clients didn't bring it in till the day after. So the medial aspect of the leg was sliced to the bone with severe injury and tearing to the muscles, tendons, ligaments, and even the joint capsule of the hock. So now I'm going to show it to you. Now. You got to wonder about the client there. They're not going to be compliant. You can tell that because they waited 24 hours to bring it. I guess they weren't going to see if it got better on its own. But the dog got sicker and sicker, so they decided to bring it in. It wasn't that Dr. Sisk wasn't available. She was. So this was because of the client basically just thinking that, you know, debating on whether they should take it to the vet or not. And this is what she was presented with. Now, this is a difficult wound to manage. That's why I picked it here. So the wound was treated on day two, three, eight, 10, 15, and 17. That's it, due to the owner's lack of compliance because the owner just would not come in. I mean, they wanted to treat him daily. Well, you can see they did the second day when they brought it in. The next day, we were still in the hospital, and then they were supposed to bring it in the next day, and they didn't. They waited till day eight. So five days went by, and then they got a bit of a lecture, and then they decided knocked that down to two days, but then we got him skipped another five and then another lecture and down to two. But again, it was lack of compliance, but she used three joules per square centimeter, 4,000 joules for each therapy session. And again, laser therapy was in a conjunction with cephaloxin, you know, standard of care for wounds, Dermadax and Tramadol. And you can see here, this is just after the laser therapy was administered on day eight. And you can see we have some, you know, basically a little bit of bleeding along there. We've increased the vascularity to this so much that it's actually bleeding a little bit. And that's, I always said, that's when you know you've given the right dose. Because if you don't see that, and we're gonna talk about that on the horse here in a little bit, but that's what it takes to stimulate that tissue. Day 15 after four laser therapy sessions. So again, would we like to have by day 15 more than four? Yes, we probably would have loved to have seven or eight, but that was not gonna happen with these clients. And this is post six therapy sessions. The last session was two weeks ago. So this is at 30 days. So they did, with many persuasions over the phone, bring it in to look at again. And uh, of course, this is after it was cleaned up a little bit, but you can see after even just 
six therapy sessions over a 30 day period of time, I mean, none within the last two weeks, so over a two week time here that this did heal quite nicely from what we had. So that was our initial and that was our healing. So I picked a thermal injury here. Uh, this is Dr. Lori Dunbar's case from Montreal, a good friend of mine. She's spoken for AMO quite a few times already and she's a, a I consider a brilliant practitioner and very good friend of mine. This was a three-year-old spayed female English setter. And on December the 7th, in Canada, they drink a lot of hot chocolate because it's cold. A family member spills a cup of hot chocolate over this dog's back. Of course, the dog screamed, hollered, yelled, but then it stopped. <laughs> so, the, you know, basically the, the, the people didn't see anything. I mean, they cleaned the hot chocolate off, but it really burned the dog. And they, there was no evidence of the burn because of all the long hair on the dog. So no immediate treatment at home and is presented December the 16th for reluctance to move and a foul odor. So once the dog started smelling, they thought, man, we better take it to Dr. Dunbar and see what she can do with it. Nine days later, gotta love them. So this is what it looked like when it was all cleaned and scrubbed up and clipped. And you can see that there's a vast amount of burn tissue here. So, you know, will laser therapy, you know, the question is, is it appropriate to put on burn tissue? Well, I got news for you. All our burn, a lot of our burn centers in the United States, I know for a fact that they're using laser therapy on the burn victims. So again, treatment plan, standard of care, antibiotics, pain relief. And again, she used t-shirts to make bandages out of it. So it'd be easy to change daily. Four joules per square centimeter off contact every other day. And this was 24 hours after the first laser therapy session and you can see that's quite a bit now i grant you clipping it up cleaning it up and you know the antibiotics and stuff have really helped but look at the basically the appearance of this the scabbing over and the contracture of the wound already and a lot of the angriness a lot of the redness has gone out a lot of the inflammation has really been relieved so that is after the post first therapy session before the second session now this case taught dr dunby and, our, and myself a, a pretty good lesson because this was after three laser therapy sessions, okay? And that looks pretty good, right? Well, it looked pretty good to the clients because they didn't return for the follow-up treatments. They thought, okay, I mean, these are the people who waited nine days to bring the dog in after they spilled the hot chocolate on it. So of course they're trying to save money. So this is a good example of why you make your clients prepay the therapy sessions. Because if they've already paid for it, there's a very, very good chance they're gonna come in and do it. So we would have liked to do, you know, Dr. Dunbar would have liked to treat this at least a few more times to make sure it's all healed and, you know, the dog was in the least amount of pain possible, but the client didn't return because they had not prepaid. Now, Dr. Dunbar gave me another interesting case. This is a seven month old male miniature schnauzer. This is recent on October the 5th, bitten on the nose by a larger older dog three days ago. They saw them playing and they, you know, knew that the other dog had bit this dog on the nose. And so, the three days ago, so that's why the wound looks like it does. It has, you know, some, basically some uh, infection going on here and everything and, and all that. And uh, the client report though, during the taking of the history is that a month history of not really feeling well and a decreased appetite, which they just couldn't understand because Dr. Dunbar had seen the dog two months ago and everything was normal and came in for a wellness check and a vaccination two months earlier, where everything was normal. And now uh, for 30 days or at least several weeks, this dog is not feeling well and a decreased appetite, okay? So there's the radiograph of it. And you can see there on that radiograph and, and she did the same thing to me that I'm doing to you. She showed me these pictures uh, and then basically asked me what I thought. And of course I did see something there, but I'm not sure what it is. But she of course anesthetized the dog and sure enough, and not included in the history was the fact that the client owned a children's daycare center and some child had wrapped a rubber band around this dog's, you know, muzzle, you know, uh, face there and basically even made it tight enough that they double banded the rubber band. So this poor dog's been trying to eat with a rubber band around his jaws. So very difficult to do and that explains it. So of course the rubber band was removed, the area was flushed, clean, all the things you normally do with that. And then it was treated four joules per square centimeter off contact daily. And this is after, day three after two treatments. And you can see that looks amazingly better. Well, I'm sure removing the rubber band had a lot to do with that. And guess what? The dog got his appetite back, ate voraciously, trying to, you know, they almost had to stop him from getting too much food here. 
So this is day five following the fourth laser therapy session. And again, you can see that this is progressing quite nicely now. And again, he got his appetite back, but the, the client honestly did not know that the rubber band was around there, but that's something you think somebody would notice. This patient was basically became a stray for 36 hours and then returned back home and came back in this shape. So we have a contaminated wound here. And again, standard patient care was clean, administered antibiotics, all those uh, things were going on here and uh, wrapped and then eight joules per square centimeter, bandage changed and every other day for three sessions and every third day for nine treatments. And that's what it looked like on day 20. So very, very nice uh, response there. This was a horse from down in Alabama where it ran around the, it's a quarter horse that basically ran around the side of a shed where the siding material was metal on the shed and was not, was blown away by a windstorm and was hanging loose on the side and that caught on this horse's hind limb or this, uh, this area here. And you can see that it just filleted the skin right off. I mean, it, it had a big hunk of tissue laying on the ground next to it again. Laser therapy daily for two weeks. Why could we do it daily? Because it was in Dr. Anna's hospital. Eight joules per square centimeter off top. After four therapy sessions, of, then they could switch to on contact, at least around the margins here. Systemic antibiotics. And the horse wasn't able to walk when it was delivered to the hospital the first day. After two weeks, every other day at 10 joules per square centimeter. And this is day you know, 21 total therapy sessions. So the horse was able to walk comfortably after seven laser therapy sessions. He was actually sound to the walk at eight weeks with her determination. But what I want you to notice is the lack of granulation tissue. Once I started using laser therapy on these types of wounds, I only had to trim granulation tissue off two wounds. And we're talking many, many that I saw each year. So when you only in years only have to trim two of them, where before you were trimming at least a third of them, that's a big, huge change. And again, that goes because our mechanism of action here and how the laser therapy stimulates and accelerates the healing of these wounds. So there's another one. This is a technician uh, up in British Columbia, Canada, 19 year old trail horse, 19 years old, not a, not a readily healer. And look at this flap to take it off or not to take it off. That's the question. And you don't know. So she sent this, God love uh, Courtney. She sent pictures. She, I bet you she sent me 40 pictures. So this was a 19 year old trail horse. She wanted to know because the, the clinic did have a laser. Now this is a trail horse that rode trails in the Rocky Mountains. So the, the, this was a rough trail. This was not a trail across rolling meadows. This was a trail up the sides of the mountains is what this horse's job was. And that was the initial image. And she, of course, used lavage, moist wraps, laser therapy, 16 sessions at 12 joules per square centimeter. And she sent me the progression of, of images here. So this was at day 12. And notice how that flap was not surgically removed, but notice how it's becoming reattached here. And, and 10 days later, it's totally reattached. And look how that wound has contracted and the swelling has gone out. And again, that's day 32. Why the red star there is that's when Courtney took him on his next trail ride. So in a month, she was able to take this horrible wound here and be able to recover it enough that she could ride the horse. Now it wasn't ridden far or anything. And day 42 is when she ceased all laser therapy and considered the wound totally healed. Now, she asked me this question and I'm sure some might come up with this question on your own, so I'll share it. She said, well, what about nitrofurazone? Because the yellow dye in there does block some of the wavelengths of infrared light. And I said, as long as you wash it off beforehand and you're washing it off anyway, when you're doing the lavage, make sure you clean all the ointment off. So you can use nitrofurazone, just don't try to laser through it, make sure it's cleaned off. This is another wound dehiscence, contaminated wound in an equine. This is a quarter horse, five years old. This is day 37. So here we have a very chronic open wound that was stitched. And what do you do with this? So what do we do? Do we you know, make this an acute wound by debriding, debriding the whole thing or what do we do? So again, standard of care of antibiotics, pain management, lavage, moist wraps and laser therapy. And again, what they did was they took an infrared thermograph and they noticed that when they did that and why they did that was to determine whether some of this was dead tissue. And you can see the blue arrow here, that tissue has no circulation and that's not a flap. That's that whole area there that has no circulation whereas there's circulation around the entire thing. So the debridement was basically, you were able to have a roadmap for debridement here by taking an image of it. And there again, that's at day 41. And you can see, you know, that's, you know, basically, look at that, you know, four days later, 
that's how good it looked after the deployment was done that day. And again, uh, we again, the region of the wound was lasered and, and the horse completely recovered. But that's how good it looked just after four days of therapy. So there's day 37 and day 41. This was epiphany for me. I'm gonna pick up the pace here a little bit. I'm talking too much. This was on an eight-year-old warm blood down in Florida at the big Grand Prix shows. And it was a, presented with an acute right forelimb lameness after competition over a bad surface. And this is where I really determined the laser therapy was a big help. Now, you might not consider a, a lesion in the tendon as a wound, but it really is. You know, it's basically there's micro hemorrhaging there. There's, you know, tearing of the tissue, the whole same thing you have when it, but this is not coming through the dermis. So again, off initially off contact and received 16 therapy sessions, passive range of motion and hand walking. This was March the 10th. This horse was worth a lot of money and they wanted to recover it. And usually that's a season ending injury right there. If not a career ending injury, we just took a horse that was very valuable and now not so much. You know, this was my, these are the only two ultrasounds I took. And this was on a 45 day recheck on April the 24th. And what, um, what I want you to notice there is there's no scar tissue problem with these is they scar in and then when the horse jumps again or does his job again that scar is not elastic and they tear again this horse here healed beautifully and uh, again that was way back when that was back in a long time ago probably in the 90s and again what we were doing or rather 2006 or something like that 2008 somewhere in there anyway again what i want you to notice is how well that tissue healed how well that tendon healed and that occurred on March the 10th and was back in training uh, again on April the 25th. You know, of course, they started out slow, but by June the 28th, two months later, this horse placed six in the same class. So instead of a season ending injury, that horse recovered totally to function that it had before the injury. Delayed fracture, delayed union. This was uh, Dr. Kim over in Indiana, and basically due to economic reasons, this client could not afford to have the orthopedic surgery that Dr. Kim wanted to do, so she was they opted for external fixation with a meta splint. Four weeks after the fracture, site is still mobile, and you, know, you can see the radiographs. If anything, it's a lot worse. <laughs> so what do you do? She calls me and she goes, how can I laser this? And I said, well, that's easy. Make a window in a splint and then apply the, the laser at all different angles, especially when you if you change the wrap or change the splint or anything like that. So she gave started after four weeks. We have a non-union here, you know, very, very mobile fracture site and twice a week for five weeks at a dosage of eight joules per square centimeter. And after five weeks and 10 therapy sessions, look at that. So you can't tell me that that resulting angiogenesis and the reduction of edema resulted in a better healing environment and allowed that non-union to basically heal. Scientific evidence, I'm not gonna give you a ton of this because you've seen a lot already, but I just put this in pubmed.gov uh, two days ago, laser therapy wound healing. I searched that term, 5,853 results. And that shows you from 67 all the way up till today, till two days ago. That's what's been published in the literature using laser therapy and wound healing. A couple of really cool studies that I saw. This is a triple bind study. Again, this was a, uh, basically they were a control sham laser or laser treatment group and eight joules per square centimeter. And they measured the epithelial migration, 153% greater wound contraction at day six in the laser group similar to what our doctor found with our uh, Penrose drain dog. Again, muscle healing, again, the treatment group far, I was there when this paper was presented at the American College of Sports Medicine Annual Conference. And again, this was a human conference, but there was a lot of emphasis on laser therapy being used in sports medicine and very efficacious. Fracture healing, I just wanted to show you that it is in the literature to use it on fractures, even because I only brought up you know one case of that. And again, remodeling of the bones, extracellular matrix, it causes you know expression of different uh, enzymes and things is what accelerated that healing. So in summary, utilizing laser therapy should be an integral part of your wound management protocol. It's scientific evidence-based, look at all the numbers, and it is very, very efficacious. In fact, I honestly don't remember a wound that did not clinically benefit from the administration of laser therapy, never. I never could say, well, well I don't wanna laser that. Well, I didn't wanna laser them when they were acute. That's the only time. So that that's it. And it's no longer does laser therapy work, believe me. That's That should be not even enter your mind. 
if you're considering buying a, a therapy laser, I can't tell you how much that'll change the way you practice. It is, am I aware of all the efficacious uses in daily veterinary practice that it can be used? So with that being said, any questions we can take right now? Uh, Remy, has anybody asked any questions? Hey, Ron, can you hear me? Can you see me? I can I can hear you, I can't see you, but that's probably because I didn't have the settings right. <laughs> So, um, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so I'm saying it again. Please ask your questions now. We can uh, have a five or ten minutes questions and then answers. Uh, and in any case, you can take uh, Ron's email or my email right now on your screen uh, if you have any question coming, further, coming in the future. Yes, I already have uh, questions for you, Ron. So, um, one question that I have, uh, and I'm going to try to uh, pronunciate well because I've never seen this word before. Would you oh, change good. your protocol for dehiscence? Dehiscence, if complete margins have not been achieved and there were still cancerous cells present. Ah, that is a very good question. So dehiscence, you were really close. What happened was is that there was no no clear margins when they removed the tumor. So would I laser that area? Uh, again, that would depend on the client and depend on what the dehiscence looked like. I probably would because yes, there's some evidence that that basically laser therapy does you know increase the circulation and that's the first thing a metastatic cell wants is more nutrition because it wants to divide more. But I still, depending on the client and depending on this case, I still would laser them. But of course, you have to communicate that with the client that says, look, I really need to heal this up as best I can. And, you know, I've got a procedure here that, but as soon as I see any evidence that we're not gaining on this wound, you know, maybe that's something to consider or, you know, provide them with options, but be clear on the understanding that that is a contraindication to a certain extent. And I have seen, you know, especially, you know, osteosarcoma, for example, Many cases of osteosarcoma where we lasered them. Why? Because of pain management. We know that you know the tumor is going to get worse, and you know what does it matter if it gets a little worse from the laser? But I didn't ever see it really markedly get worse once the laser therapy was in this, initiated for analgesia. So that's a good question, and I think that's going to have to be addressed on a case by case basis. Okay, I have another question too, uh, a simpler one. How to measure exa exactly the area in square centimeters? Okay, well, that's <laughs> how do I how do I do that in square centimeters rather than sit there and take a ruler? I'll give you a good example of a general rule of thumb. Uh, uh, playing cards. I'm sure you have playing cards just like we do. Decks of playing cards there. Or, you know, and what that is, is almost about 60 square centimeters. An index card that is, you know, three by five inches, and I'm struggling here to do the conversion to centimeters for you, but that is 100 square centimeters. So, you know, index cards that we use for all kinds of things, you know, to write notes on and whatnot, I'm sure there's something similar over there. Posted notes is about 50 square centimeters. So if you use those and you just picture in your mind, put a playing card over the area there and know that that's really close to 60 square centimeters and then you can do the math. If I want to give it 10 joules per square centimeter and that playing card covers my wound, I'm going to give it 600 joules, okay? Now, here's the good part about it. I really don't think you can overdose laser therapy. All you're doing when you do that is, you know, not making efficient use of your time. And so this is something that you're not going to be, you should not have the fear of that you're going to create a supercell or do anything like that. So just use a, you know, measure something that you can picture in your mind to be able to put over the wound area so that you'll have an easy reference in your mind. Okay. Um... Do you confirm that the cases that you've shown were done with a class four lasers? And... Yeah, every single one of them was. Now, a lot of times the cells really don't care where the laser comes from, but the advantage of the class four laser is, of course, time to administer it. And basically the depth of penetration is governed by the wavelengths and by the power. 
So if I have a wavelength that's going to discover, you know, basically govern the depth and power is going to determine the number of photons there. A lot of wounds are superficial. So can they be treated with a class 3B? Yes, they're going to take a long time to do it, but that's okay. But those, all those cases that I have presented were, you, a class 4 laser was used. There were several different ones, but yes, every single one of them had a class 4 laser. Okay, so... What else can we treat with a class four laser? Like, do you have any uh, other example? Like, the, I know, I know the answer. I know there are a lot of them, but can you maybe give yeah. a, an example of five? Uh, a little cross cut, sure. I mean, let's talk dermatology first. Lick granulomas. That's uh, almost a miracle. <laughs> I mean, at first we started dosing them low, then we started dosing them at 25 and 30 joules per square centimeter, and they almost stop licking them the very same day. Uh, you know, as far as other things, I have treated, and I did a whole lecture on this of the different applications. So if you want to go back through and look at that webinar again, it'll give you a better idea. But I think a couple of the things that, you know, dental problems, uh, abscesses, uh, any kind of musculoskeletal injury whatsoever. I mean, the literature is there showing that, but I'll tell you one of the things that amazed me, which I found about only about six years ago, was using it for renal failure in the feline. I mean, it's well documented all over the literature how to use that as an adjunct. And I'm telling you what, when you think about how laser therapy works, you'll understand why it helps some of these, these our older felines that are in renal failure. Something that you wouldn't normally think about, pneumonia. Uh, upper respiratory problems, anything, because we're boosting the immune response, we're boosting the circulation to the area. We're basically stimulating the body to heal itself. So anything that you can heal, now is the laser gonna treat liver or something like that? No, not really. Is it gonna be able to reach every aspect of the bowel? And believe me, they've tried to use it for irritable bowel syndrome and I haven't seen anybody that's had real good luck yet. But a lot of the other things, uh, you know, again, the kidneys because of their anatomical location can be reached. Uh, you know, otitis, uh, urinary problems in the cat, the bladder is, you know, if you, depending on how you hold the cat in position to administer the laser, our target tissue is right at the end of the handpiece. So that inflamed, you know, bladder inside there, that inflamed urinary tract inside there is easy to reach. So feline urinary tract problems for you, you know, canine urinary tract problems, depending on the size of the dog, can be e easily reached, but a lot of it has to do with musculoskeletal problems. You know, again, uh, recovery from surgery, post-surgical, you know, stimulate those those incisions to heal right away. And a good example is uh, a dog has a, you know, has hip dysplasia and you remove, basically you do an osteo, you know, take the head of the femur off the one side. Where's he putting all his weight? He's putting all his weight on the other side. So laser, not only that incision where you did that surgery, but also the other side. Uh, because that's, what do we tell him? Oh my gosh, he's going to probably have the same thing. Cruciate ligament, same thing. I replace, you know, find a cruciate dog and we say, well, we're going to do surgery on this. We're going to repair this. But, you know, more than likely, you know, we put, you know, a lot of times the other one goes. The other one has the same thing happen to it. So let's be proactive here. Let's use the laser proactively and treat that area while he's stressing it as a secondary compensatory area for his weight, off shifting his weight so that we can do that. And the list goes on and on. That's, I could speak on that for an hour, but I suggest you yeah. look at the, the webinar. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're gonna take two more questions, uh, everyone. So you, you can write uh, if you want, and of course we can reply to you later later on. So the same doctor that asked you for the exact area, you know, in square centimeters, mm -hmm. is saying that if it's a two month dog, really small with deep tissue, chronic respiratory disease, which contact and wavelength should we use? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the disorder here. What was it? Chronic what? Respiratory disease. Res respiratory disease. Okay. Okay. A small dog. Yes. Sure. What wavelength? Well, you know, 810, 980, anything in the upper wavelengths there uh, is going to penetrate that tissue really well. You would have to treat them if possible on contact because, and you're gonna have to, if it's respiratory, you're gonna have to treat between the ribs. So you're gonna use a very small handpiece and low wattage of power, maybe two, three watts, so that we can get saturation. And basically what do you wanna to try to do is aim the handpiece everywhere that you possibly can. 
So we can treat that respiratory condition because it depends on what it is. And you can use your radiographs for a roadmap for the laser. I mean that, that you know if you see an area that's really congested or has a you know quite a bit of fluid buildup on it, that's where you want to make sure the most of your dose is. And I would you know again, again the dosage on those would probably be a very small dog like that, probably two to three joules per square centimeter. But again, try to administer it in the intercostal space. I I have to I have to say I'm I'm super impressed every time. We just give you a case. And in a second, you give a, you're giving us how to treat it and which way. This is amazing. That's what happens when you're old. That's what happens when you're old and you've seen a lot. <laughs> well, I, tried to, I tried to cure bleeders and horses with the same principle that I just gave him for that small dog. And I didn't oh. have a whole lot of success. So, <laughs> so by failing, I know how that would, his case or their case would be an easier case to treat. That's for sure. And uh, that's, uh, that's so... I mean, I'm so proud and happy that uh, you have participated also in uh, creating the protocols uh, on uh, our laser. So now we know uh, that you are the specialist and this is helping a lot of vets, uh, you know, using laser that are not uh, really uh, comfortable so far with uh, the technology. Uh, my last question, and this is my question. At the beginning, you were talking about uh, that you were working with laser up to 60 uh, watts. And you say that's way more than the veterinarians will need to use. Can you can you explain that a little bit to some of our colleagues? Yes, that yeah, and maybe I shouldn't have said that because there is one company that does have a 60 watt therapy laser, and the reason for them developing them that was to treat our large professional athletes in football, not soccer, American football. <laughs> we have massive amount, 320, 340 size dark-skinned uh, linemen that they basically designed that laser for. And I, you know, of course, was asked to take a look at it and everything, and there is just almost no application for that in the veterinary field. Yes, you might think that would be you do well on a horse, but you better darn well know what you're doing because that really is a lot of energy and a lot of power. And you do have the chance of, of, you know, of course, first thing I did was put it on my arm. What happened? I moved my arm really fast because it burned. <laughs> so we want to make sure that the energy that we administer is safe. And, you know, you can get up to, you know, 12, 15, 20, 25, or even 30 watts. And if you know what you're doing and you know you're really good at application, you know, you can use those lasers. But to have something that's powerful over even 20, 25 watts, is there's only a few cases that would benefit from it. And companion animal, I don't know any. That's more for the equine and the exotics. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to even treat the elephants at the Barnum and Bailey uh, retirement home for their circus elephants. And there, I wouldn't have, I don't even think I would have used the 61 laser. So, there you are. Yes. Yeah, so we don't need that much power to have an efficient no. uh, device uh, in a clinic. Right? That's right. No, okay. correct. Absolutely not. Absolutely. The the power that you have on your laser is is a very, you know, good power, a wide range of powers. I mean, it's like I always say, you can turn a, a larger, higher powered laser down. You can't turn a lower powered laser up. So you can make your laser into a class 3B laser by administering 500 milliwatts. But you cannot, you know, take a class 3B laser that's 500 milliwatts and make it, you know, admit three watts, no matter how the emission of the of the of the energy is and there's some misconception on some of the marketing from some of the companies that give you that impression and that's just not true so. okay so i received a few messages of uh, many veterinarians thanking you ron i'm thanking yes. you again as always this is so interesting and i love your passion about laser therapy mm -hmm. and uh, this is really a device that i love and a technology that i love and it's probably thanks to you so thank you so much ron and uh, all, the, all the veterinarians are with me today to thank you. I hope you all, all of you enjoyed it. And uh, of course, uh, send us your questions. Talk to your distributors if you have any questions regarding the distribution of, la of a laser in your country, if you're interested in uh, getting in that uh, technology in your practice. Bye-bye, Ron. Bye, Dr. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And some very good questions there. See, I learn something every day. Thanks again. Take care.